Welcome back. Um, what we're going to do in this video is we're going to finish up the reversal of pyruvate kinase. Okay, and one thing I didn't really do in the mechanism of pyruvate carboxylase is I didn't really mention that we're we're reversing pyruvate kinase from glycolysis. Um, what we did in the first part, which was the last video, is we looked at the mechanism of pyruvate pyruvate carboxylase, and but that wasn't the end of it. Um, pyruvate kinase is a, a reaction is so exergonic in, in other words its delta g is so far less than zero it's so spontaneous that you can't just reverse it, um, it using the same enzyme you have to use another enzyme and not only do you have to use another enzyme you have to use two well the first one was pyruvate carboxylase in this one we're going to look at an enzyme called phosphoenol pyruvate carboxy carboxy kinase okay and this video should not be too terribly long because, in fact, this is probably a really easy mechanism. Um, in fact, if I was, if I had time to do it on an exam, if I was making the exam, um, I'd probably give you an easy mechanism and a hard one. This would be the easy one. Okay. Um, so this particular uh, reaction is a little bit different because instead of requiring ATP, it's requir requiring what you see here, and that's guanosine triphosphate. So this is GTP. Notice the uh, guanine that's right here. Okay, so this is a GTP dependent reaction, and part of the the way that this enzyme is going to overcome um, generating the very unstable phosphoenol pyruvate is it's going to use a positive delta S. It's going to use a positive delta S to drive the reaction forward. Okay, now recall from pyruvate carboxylase. Remember that what we had done is we had generated oxaloacetate right so let me draw that okay so here's oxaloacetate okay and I'm gonna go ahead and draw out this carboxyl group and you'll see why I do that in a minute okay so here's oxaloacetate remember it's often abbreviated OAA now one thing I want to do very briefly in this um, before we actually do the mechanism what I want to do is actually come over here and show you something and that's that we're going from oxaloacetate Okay, which is not terribly unstable, it's pretty stable. And we're going to phosphoenol pyruvate. Okay? Now, when you look at the structure of phosphoenol pyruvate, which I'm drawing right now, okay, the first thing you should notice immediately is that it's a derivative of an enol. And the enol can be seen right here. Okay, this part is the enol. Okay? And if you remember, enols are not stable. They're very, very, very high energy. So they're high energy and they're low stability, very unstable. And oxaloacetate is nowhere near as unstable as PEP. So what we're doing is we're, I mean, if, in terms of in terms of the free energy, we're going from something with a lower free energy to something with a higher free energy. And if you were to look at that, that's not it's not really the most stable or not stable it's not really the most favorable thing in the world but part of the reason that this reaction is able to occur is because this reaction is going to use a positive increase in entropy in its favor okay so let's actually look at the mechanism now okay so the first part is we're going to have this lone pair on this carboxyl group and what's going to happen is it's good the first step is just the decarboxylation so these electrons kick in here and immediately carbon dioxide is going to leave but in the process what's going to happen is these electrons are going to form um, a bond here and this pi bond is going to come out and abstract a pro uh, not a proton a phosphate it's the gamma phosphate from GTP so nucleophilic attack generation of the trigonal bipyramidal intermediate pi bond reforms and you kick off GDP okay so what you end up generating in this me in this mechanism is number one the first thing that's going to come off the first thing that should come off is going to be um, carbon dioxide okay and the next thing that should come off is your guanosine diphosphate so notice how in our arrow pushing the first thing that did come off was the carbon dioxide and then um, the next step was the actual phosphate abstraction by these electrons, excuse me, um, these electrons right here. Okay, so where I'm, where I'm highlighting, those are the electrons that actually come out and abstract the gamma phosphate from GTP. Okay, now 
What we end up generating along with the GDP is we end up generating phosphoenyl pyruvate. So I'll go ahead and draw that again. And again, you can look at the structure of PEP and you can tell that it is pretty unstable, right? And very unstable. In fact, one thing that you should know about PEP, phosphoenyl pyruvate, is it is the most unstable high energy molecule that ordinarily you'll encounter in Biochem 1 and 2. It's terribly unstable. Um, very high energy. You really won't encounter anything like it. And the reason that it's so unstable is because it's in the enol form. Okay. Now let's actually look at this. Okay. What I'm going to do for you is I'm going to show you um, the reactants. Okay. And let's look at the reactants. Okay. Let me do those in orange. Okay. So our first reactant is GTP, right? That's our first reactant, GTP. And our only other reactant that we have is oxaloacetate, right? OAA. So those are two reactants. Now let me do the products in green. So let's count how many products we have. Well, number one, we have phosphoenyl pyruvate, right? But we also have GDP and CO2, right? So let's think about this from a general chemistry perspective. We're going from, in this case, two, we're going from two, let me do it in a box because I already did the circles. So we have two reactants, right? And then we're going to how many products? We're going to three products, right? So that process right there is going to represent a positive delta S. We're going to more moles of products, right, per reaction. So this reaction represents a positive delta S. And if you go and look at the one of the forms of the Gibbs free energy equation, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, what happens to the overall delta G as you have a positive delta S? Well, this whole term right here remains positive, and since you're subtracting it, it contributes to a more negative delta G. Okay, and this reaction is the delta G is low enough to where it can occur. But for instance, if you didn't have the decarboxylation, if you just had two moles of reactant to two moles of product, this reaction would probably not work. You might even have to have a third enzyme. So the way, so th this this should tell you that PEP is terribly unstable really high in energy. You have to have two whole reactions to reverse pyruvate kinase from glycolysis. Okay, And one thing that's also worth mentioning about this particular enzyme is that pyru or excuse me, phosphoenyl pyruvate carboxykinase is both a mitochondrial enzyme and a cytosolic enzyme. So depending on which route you use to um, to perform gluconeogenesis, at least this reversal, um, it's going to di dictate which PEP carboxykinase you use. And there's going to be another video on that process. So let's do a quick recap what we've seen so far. Okay, Remember that pyruvate kinase has a delta G far less than zero, very negative. In fact, pyruvate kinase's delta G is the lowest and, and highest in magnitude in terms of negativity of all of glycolysis. Okay, So you have to have two whole enzymes to reverse it, pyruvate carboxylase and PEP carboxykinase. Unlike some of the other ATPases, this is a GTP-dependent reaction. So notice how I drew the guanine up here. Okay, And so the first step is going to use oxaloacetate, and you're going to generate CO2, and that's the purple electron arrows that I've shown. Okay, And then you're going to generate phosphoenyl pyruvate in the second step, and that's using um, these electrons right here that, remember, I... I uh, I really highlighted those. Those are going to come out and abstract the gamma phosphate from GTP. And just remember, remember you, you the same thing applies to GTP that it did for ATP. Here's your alpha phosphate, your beta phosphate, and then this up here is your gamma phosphate. Right? And so what you end up generating is carbon dioxide, guanosine diphosphate, and phosphoenyl pyruvate. And one, remember, one important thing that I could, if, if I was making the test, I would ask it, is that if you are, how, why is it that this enzyme is able to do this? How are you able to generate such an unstable product? And the reason lies in the fact that this enzyme has an, generates an increase in entropy. You're going from two products with oxaloacetate and GTP to three products, CO2, GDP, and PEP. Okay. That represents a positive delta S and contributes to enough negativity of the delta G that the overall process can occur um, using the enzyme. Okay. So I hope this video gave you a little bit of intuition on, on PEP carboxykinase. And just remember, in another video, we'll see that um, this enzyme is both mitochondrial and cytosolic. See you in the next video.